So we finally get back to Romans chapter 9, so you might want to turn there in your Bibles, Romans chapter 9, we left off a few weeks ago, we've been working through the letter to, um, to the Romans, uh, ch chapter 9 to 11 are of the most controversial chapters in the letter, um, maybe in the Bible, I don't know, <laughs> certainly seems like that sometimes. But in all honesty, I think they're controversial, not so much because they're hard to understand. Um, they're just hard to accept. Uh, it's not because we can't understand what God is saying in these texts as much as we don't like what he's saying, to be honest. And that's because we come to the text with frameworks. We learned about those in the Dig and Discover course recently. Frameworks, presuppositions perspectives, a worldview, an understanding. Some of those are doctrinal understanding. Some of those are personal convictions. And we come to the text with those. And we read the text through those. And we struggle to ex accept what it says because of those. They cloud our understanding. They are our biases. And all of us come with them. And the more the text differs from our pre-understanding, the more we struggle with it, to understand it and to accept it. So I think the next few chapters are going to be challenging for all of us. Uh, if you find yourself feeling a bit emotional or a bit confused or maybe even a bit angry, it might be because I'm not explaining the text well. And it might be because it's challenging your framework. And as we looked in, uh, in the Dig and Discover course, it's important that we let the text be king. It's important that we modify our, ta our frameworks uh, to line up with the text of Scripture. We can wrestle, we can struggle, but we at the end of the day need to submit to who God has revealed Himself to be in Scripture and Scripture alone. That is actually what the process of sanctification is. It's conforming our thinking, our perspectives to God's. And understand, as sinners, whenever we approach God and His Word, we're always going to come with a, a pre-understanding, a, a conviction, a bias, and those are often going to be warped and twisted and distorted by sin or by experiences we've had, bad or good. And we need to submit those to the Lord. So Romans chapter 9, verses 1 to 13, let's read the text, and then we'll look at it in detail. Romans chapter 9 verses 1 to 13. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. It's not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But... Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it's not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise who are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our father, forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. So the first thing we need to do here is get into the mindset or the framework of the original author to understand this, the problem of this text from his perspective. And so I want to look at the problem firstly in verses 1 to 6, and then the solution, verses 6 to 13, and then the implications of it, really focusing on verse 11. So that's how we'll unfold this text. Firstly, the problem. And this is a problem. 
and not just because of the verse 13, but because of how this whole uh, section starts. He says there, can you hear the emotion? I'm speaking the truth in Christ Jesus. I'm not lying. My conscience bears witness in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is bearing witness, witness with my conscience. So he's speaking about the truthfulness of, about what he's saying or about to say in verse 1. And then in verse 2, he says, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. And that talks about the emotion, the grief with which he says it. There's passion involved here, and there's truth involved here. And then in verse 3, he says, I wish that I could be cut off or cursed for the sake of my brothers. And that emphasizes the seriousness of what he's about to communicate, of this problem, of this issue. Paul is not taking this lightly. He's getting our attention as he starts off here and saying, this is a massive problem. I want you to know, I'm telling you the truth. I mean what I say. I'm emotional about what I say. And it is so important that I, I could even wish that I was cut off from Christ. What is the problem that is causing Paul such grief and anguish that he feels he needs to say this with so much emotion and emphasis? There in verse 4 and 5. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. He's talking about the nation of Israel, yeah, ethnic Israel, his kinsmen, his brothers, according to the flesh, as he puts it in verse 3. They are God's chosen people, God's elect special nation, chosen from among all the nations to be God's treasured possession. And he goes on to summarize their privileged position as a nation. In the Greek, there's assonance, a rhyming of sounds, which puts these uh, terms into pairs. The adoption and the giving of the law, one pair. The glory and the worship, another pair. The covenants and the promises, another pair. And these pairs are also logically and thematically rela related. The adoption or the sonship and the giving of the law probably refers to Sinai when God adopted Israel as his nation, as his people, as his son. And he entered into a covenant relationship with them where he laid, which was laid out in the law of Moses. And he said he will be their God and they will be his people as Exodus 6-7 puts it, the adoption. And then the, the other two terms there, the glory and the worship, and the, the term that's been translated worship here refers more specifically to the sacrificial worship, the sacrificial system. So the worship and the glory, and the whole sacrificial system God gave Israel so that um, they could be a holy people before him. And he gave them the priesthood and the, the, the Levitical sacrifices and the temple and the tabernacle where the Shekinah glory of God came and dwelt in the midst of his people. And you can see how that's connected then thematically. This was the means by which God's people uh, could be holy unto him and by which God could dwell in the midst of his people and they could know his glory and his presence among them. And then the covenants and the promises those two belong together as well. The promises that God gave to the nation of Israel, which he ratified in various covenants, which naturally he made to the patriarchs, to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob and to Moses and to David. And that's why he goes on in verse 5 to talk about the, this lineage that belongs to Israel. And he is talking about ethnic Israel, yeah, the nation of Israel. This is their lineage. From their lineage, according to the flesh, from this people comes the Christ. That's his title, the Messiah. He came from the Jewish nation and for the Jewish nation. And the patriarchs obviously refers to the start of this nation, the covenant that God entered into with Abraham to say, I'll bless you in Genesis 12, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing, and all nations on earth will be blessed through you. That was the beginning point. And then unfolded God's covenant promises, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, the nation of Israel, into Exodus, into Egypt, deliverance from Egypt, and then into the promised land under the Mosaic Covenant. All of that began pointing God's people for the climax of all that God had planned and purposed for them was to send the Christ, Jesus, their Messiah, 
And he's no ordinary man. He's Lord over all. As Paul says there in verse 5, and not just that, he is God over all, blessed forever. Paul is summarizing here yeah, the whole of redemptive history, which is focused on the nation of Israel up to this point, and which climaxes in the person and work of Jesus Christ. The Old Testament, as it were. How could this nation, which is God's chosen people, God's covenant people, who played such a vital role in the story of salvation up to this point, how could they have rejected their Messiah? How could they find themselves rejecting God himself outside of salvation, outside of his blessings? This is the situation that Paul finds unthinkable and unacceptable. This is exactly his concern there in verse 6. It's not as though the word of God has failed. That's the real problem here. Hang on a minute. God made promises. God gave revelation. And this has not been realized. And how can it be? How can it be that it's not realized in this nation? And that's his real concern. So maybe let's just back up and then in our minds, refresh our minds about the argument that he's been making up to this point, right? In the letter of Romans. Hopefully that'll... Um, bring home to you the conundrum, the difficulty the, that Paul finds himself in. If you just go back to Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1 verse 13, who's he writing to? Romans 1 13, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I've often intended to come to you, but have thus far been prevented in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. So he's writing to the church at Rome, a church composed largely of Gentiles, though there were probably some Jews amongst them as well, right? And he writes to really ground them in the gospel so he can use them to be a gospel outreach to, to the western part of the empire. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, he lays out what we would regard as the summary verse for the whole of Romans. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for the salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And from the beginning, he's laying out this gospel, this good news, this good news for both Jew and Gentile. But first he has to present the bad news. The Gentiles aren't righteous, and they're under God's wrath in the rest of chapter 1. The Jews are unrighteous and deserving of God's wrath in chapter 2. And therefore all are unrighteous and deserving of God's wrath in chapter 3. Look at chapter 3 and verse 9. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one, right? Which lays the framework for saying no one is going to be justified by their works, by adherence to the law, by their heritage, by their ancestry, by their position. What is the means by which people will be righteous before God? Only one. In verse 21, now the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. And what's the distinction? Jew, Gentile, doesn't matter what your background. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the re redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And he goes on then in chapter 4 to explain that it is by faith in Jesus Christ and not by any works, not by um, circumcision or any heritage that uh, a person might have. Look at chapter 4 and verse 1. What shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? The very first patriarch himself was not justified by his works. God has always saved people by grace through faith alone. If Abraham was justified by his works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And the argument goes, uh, that he goes on to make in chapter 4 is that he was counted as righteous before he was circumcised. So it was not based on his works, but by his faith in God and his word. And then from chapter 5, he begins to lay out then the blessings that come to 
those who believe. If you look at chapter 5 and verse, verse 1, let me just back up one point he makes in, in chapter 4, verse 16, when he's emphasizing it's by faith, because it, he picks up on this in, in chapter 9. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only the adherents of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And he makes the point there briefly that those who have faith in Jesus Christ become the the offspring of Abraham. And he's the father of us all, Jew and Gentile, all who have faith in Jesus Christ. And so then he goes on to lay out what do we receive, those who've placed our faith in Jesus Christ. Chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, as we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We have peace with God, we have reconciliation, we have justification. In chapter 6, we have died to sin through faith in Jesus Christ. In chapter 7, we've died to the law. In chapter 8, he he summarizes this glorious hope that we have um, because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Chapter 8, verse 1, forgiveness of sins. 8, verse 4, the righteousness of the law fulfilled in us. 8, verse 5, indwelling by the Spirit. Verse 14, adoption as sons. Verse 17, the inheritance of Christ, the greatest inheritance. Verse 18, the hope of glory. Verse 26, the intercession of the Spirit. And verse 34, the intercession of Christ. And then he, 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 he's got this climax in, in verses 28 and 30, all things working together for our good. Verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, he pre- predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that we might be the firstborn among many brothers. Those whom he predestined, he called. Those whom he called, he justified. Those whom he justified, he glorified. And he goes on to say, therefore we are unconditionally loved. And nothing and no one can ever separate us from the love of God. And all of this sounds like wonderful good news, doesn't it? And we've all been reading it and saying, this is amazing. The blessings of Abraham have at last come to all the nations and all these promises have been realized that God has been making in and through the work of Jesus Christ. And they've come to us and we rejoice in him. But they have not come to Israel. That's the rub. All these promises that God had been making, the fulfillment of all that he'd been doing in this plan of redemption has been Realize that's what Romans 8 is all about. All the hope and the glory and the forgiveness and the reconciliation has been realized in Jesus Christ and we're enjoying it, but Israel isn't. And Paul can't conceive of this. How can it be? And the problem is, you know, if you could think about it, it's almost like God has wrought this massive deliverance and done all of these miracles. If you could picture the first exodus, the first redemption, the the pre-shadow of the ultimate redemption, right? And God has worked all these miracles and subdued Pharaoh and flattened Egypt. and, And rather than his people being led out of Egypt... Egyptians saw the miracles and the Egyptians go out of Egypt and into the promised land and the Israelites stay behind. That's kind of what Paul's looking at. The fuller redemption here and and the Israelites are left behind. They find themselves outside of redemption and under God's wrath. How can this be? Was God not meant to deliver Israel, his people, And the rub goes beyond that. It's not just that Israel have been left out. That that bothers Paul, for sure, because he identifies with his blessed nation. But the bigger problem for him is, what has become of the promises of God? What has become of the faithfulness of God? What has become of all the things that God said he would do? Can, Can we trust him? And that's a concern for us. Because if all the hope that God had given Israel and all the promises that he'd given Israel have not been realized for them, if all the historic hope and promises that had been given have not been realized, then how does the hope that we have, 
which is yet to be realized? How do the promises that we've been given, which are yet to be realized, how, we know, how do we know that they'll come to pass? If God hasn't been faithful to His purposes and His plan and His promises in the past, how do we know He'll be faithful in the future? If those who, we were, who were His covenant chosen people and the recipients of these promises in the past find themselves fallen from grace and outside of God's plans and purposes and under His wrath, then how do we know that the same might not happen to us as what happened to them? Can you now sense the depth of the problem? This is a massive problem. He's just traced for us the glorious hope that we have as Gentiles, but it means nothing if we cannot depend on the promises of God. If God can change his mind and work things out differently. And so that's what he's got to begin addressing. Why is it a problem? Just just consider this for a moment. Jeremiah 29. We love quoting this verse. (laughs) Jeremiah 29. This is made to Israel when they were in exile. And thought that they were cast off. Thought that they were, found themselves broken the covenant outside of God's favor. They were exiles in Babylon. And this is the message he sends to them. Jeremiah 29. Verse 10. For thus says the Lord. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you. And I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart, and I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile." And God made promises to them. And what do those promises mean? If they haven't been realized in the nation of Israel. Because they were the original recipients. When God sent a message to the exiles through Jeremiah, it was ethnic Israel that he was speaking to. Has God failed to keep his word? Has he made empty promises that he's found himself unable to keep? Were his plans and his best intentions thwarted by the rebellion and unfaithfulness of Israel, who now find themselves cast off, unadopted, and unloved? And this is the real crisis for Paul, which must be addressed. The very faithfulness of God is at stake. That's what he alluded to way back in Romans chapter 3. Even he's beginning to unfold this argument. He knows where he's heading. And in Romans chapter 3, verse 3, he says, What if some were unfaithful? Talking about the Jews. Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though every man is a liar. He's saying, that's unthinkable. God is true and true to his word, though everyone were a liar. Nothing and no one can thwart the promises and plans and purposes of God. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. That's what he has just affirmed. He better show how God's promises are realized in the light of ethnic Israel rejecting their Messiah. Do you see the problem? Do you feel the weight of it? Put it another way, in order for us to have the unshakable hope that Paul has been putting before us in Romans 5 to 8, we must have an answer for what has become of ethnic Israel. What has become of their hope? How is God working out his promises and his redemption toward them? We must have an answer for that. So the solution, or the first part of the solution, right? We're going to work through the solution right all the way through to chapter 11. But his inspired answer is found in verses 6 to 13. It's not as though the word of God has failed, 
Not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all who are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it's not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of promise who are counted as offspring. So the first part of his answer of what has become of ethnic Israel and God's promises to them is that God always directed these promises to a select group within Israel. It was not all of Abraham's descendants. Every last Israelite who was the rightful recipient of God's promises. That's his answer. God's promises and plans for redemption was never for every single ethnic Jew, but it was directed specifically to those whom he chose and called out from among the rest. That's the first part of his answer. How do we know that God's promises to, uh, have not failed? Paul says, because when God made those promises, he never applied them to every single individual Jew, but only to those whom he chose or selected out from amongst those descendants. That's his point. So he says that not all who are physical descendants of Israel truly belong to Israel, in verse 6. Even in the Old Testament, there were physical descendants by birth who were excluded from the promises and the covenants and the plans and purposes of God. You hear that? Even in the Old Testament, as you correctly read the Old Testament, there were descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob by birth, by lineage, by heritage, who were excluded from the promises and plans and purposes of God and God's elective purposes, who are not truly Israel. He says the same thing in a slightly different way in verse 7. Not all the physical descendants of Abraham are the objects and recipients of God's grace and his promised blessing. In other words, there's a bunch of descendants who can rightfully claim their ethnicity to Abraham, their lineage to Abraham, who all along the way were excluded from God's covenant plans and purposes and promises. This one and not that one. This one and not that one. God's election. God's sovereign election. He's arguing that the promises of God didn't fail because they were not directed ever towards every single physical descendant of Abraham without exception. They were never intended for every single Jew, but this select group within the nation, sovereignly and freely chosen by grace. That's his point. Now, this is a paradigm shift for Jews, right? They've never thought of it this way. And so he better summon some weighty evidence to support his argument. And his first line of evidence comes there in verse um, 8. Verse 7, we can read from verse 7. Not all are children of Abraham, because there is offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it's not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise who are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said, about this time next year I will return and Sarah will have a son. So there's two sons of Abraham. One is chosen to be the recipient of the promise and the plans and the purpose and the redemptive plans of God, and the other is not. It'll be Isaac and not Ishmael. Ishmael was the firstborn. Technically, according to culture and custom and norm, he should have been the one to receive the inheritance. He was the prominent one amongst the other descendants. But God excludes him by sovereign election and says, no, it's through Isaac will your offspring be named. Isaac is the one through whom I'm going to fulfill these promises and purposes and carry out my covenant promises. Two descendants, only one is chosen or selected from among the two to be the object of God's plans and purposes. That's supporting his point that not Israel belonged to Israel. Not all who can trace their lineage from these forefathers actually belong to the focal point of God's elective grace. Some would be quick to object at this point and say, hang on a minute. Ishmael was by Hagar. 
That's the reason why. You know, Hagar wasn't really his wife. It was her maidservant. She was just a concubine. He wasn't like a completely legitimate son. And so, Paul, you've got it wrong. It's not because God elects some and doesn't elect others. It's really because of that fact. He was not really a legitimate heir in the first place. So Paul summons a second line of evidence in verses 10, or the second part of this verse 9, 10. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. Now he takes twins, born to the, the father of Israel, Isaac, right? And he says, he has two twins, and God chooses one and not the other. God makes one the object of his plans and purposes in redemption and not the other. And in fact, here again, technically, Esau is the older. He's the firstborn, if only by a few minutes. And yet God reverses that natural order and says, no, but I'm going to work out my plans and purposes through Jacob. And again, his point is to descendants. One becomes the focal point of God's redemptive plan and purpose and promise, and the other is excluded. Not all Israel are Israel. Not all the descendants by natural lineage are chosen sovereignly by God's grace to be the objects of his plans and purposes and promises as he works out redemption. And this is an undeniable example. God's words and and promises have not failed, Paul can say. It's not as though the word of God has failed because he never directed his promises to every single Israelite. All along, as we trace out his plan and purpose, there were some from those descendants that he chose out and selected sovereignly to be the objects of his grace and purpose and plans and promises, and others he did not. That's his point. Paul doesn't just stop there by just showing that some of Abraham's descendants were chosen recipients of God's promises and not others. He goes further to talk about what is the nature of this election. He says in verse 11, Though they not, were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue not because of works, but because of him who calls, he was told the older will serve the younger. And he's drawing from the Genesis history here. And just go back for a moment to Genesis 25 so you can see the passages he's uh, alluding to, Genesis chapter 25. Genesis 25, 21. Rebecca's got these two boys wrestling in her womb. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife, and because she was barren, the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older will serve the younger. Two peoples would come from these two sons. Two nations would come from them, Edom and Israel. And Israel would be the object of God's grace and favor, and not Edom. His proof is undeniable. Notice what he highlights if you go back to Romans 9. When was this choice made? 9 verse 11. Before they were even born. Before they'd done anything good or bad. So that God's purpose in election might stand not because of anything we do anything we are not because of our faithfulness but because of him who chooses jacob becomes the recipient and channel of god's grace and his promise not because of physical descent not because of aptitude or faith or obedience or merit or response on his heart the basis why he becomes is God's sovereign election. 
God chooses before they've ever done a single thing. God decides who will become the object of his plan and purposes. So that's the problem and that's the first part of the solution. Let's just consider for a moment the implications, particularly there in verse 11. God's promises were never indiscriminately made. I mean, Paul's making a commentary here. They were always directed personally and specifically towards his elect, to those whom he has chosen. His choice and his election are not based on human merit or ancestry or works or worth. They are sovereign and free. And before they were even born, this demonstrates the outworking of God's elective purposes. And notice the contrast there in verse 11. Not by works, but by him who calls. In other words, works or merit or worth is placed on one side of the equation and him who calls is on the other side. And some would say, well, God looked ahead and saw what these people would do and on that basis he elected them. But you can't do that because Paul puts these two things in, in, in opposing camps. It's not on this basis. It's not on the basis of works or merit or anything God sees, but by his sovereign election, by his purpose in election. He contrasts them. Not that he sees something that would, then he responds to and says, on that basis I elect them. And he grounds the timing of that election here before they'd ever even been born or done anything. This is when God decided who would become the object of his grace and purpose. By him who calls. And that should then bring our minds back to what he's just been speaking about in Romans 8, right? Those whom God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Romans 8, 28. Verse 29. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Those whom he predestined, he called those whom he called, he justified. Those whom he justified, he glorified. And what was the ultimate outcome of this unbroken chain? God predestined, foreknown, called, justified, glorified. Therefore, we are completely secure in his love. Unconditional covenant love. That's the ultimate outcome of God's choice. Is that he brings us into a, a relationship of unconditional covenant love which is exactly why Paul then moves on in Romans chapter 9 to say as it is written Jacob I loved but Esau I hated this is about whom God loves whom God chooses to set his love upon whom he shows love towards in a specific and personal way conditional unconditional covenant love and he quotes there from Malachi 1 so just turn in your Bibles to Malachi chapter 1 the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 1. Verse 2. I have loved you, says the Lord, speaking to Israel. But you say, how have you loved us? Because they don't find themselves a whole lot better. Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says they may, re they may build, but I will tear down, and they will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever." Your own eyes will see this and you will say, Great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. He's contrasting these two nations and saying, Now listen, we know Israel's history, don't we? They're as sinful as any other nation. They're as rebellious and idolatrous as any other nation. And they themselves look at it and say, You know, what basis are you saying you've loved us? And God says, Look at your destinies. The nations that come from these two sons, Esau I've cast off, and they'll be laid waste, and they'll be objects of my anger forever. But you I have loved. 
And he's calling on that to say that's ultimately what God is doing in electing. He's drawing us into a love relationship with him that we don't get what we deserve. We don't get what other people get. God treats us with distinction. He treats us with electing love, condition, unconditional love, covenant love. We deserve what they get, but we don't get what they get. We get love. We get forgiveness. We get promises. We get a destiny. We get glory. And it's not based on anything we do. This is what is known as unconditional election. It's the basis of what's called Reformed Doctrine or the Doctrines of Grace or Calvinism, unconditional elect election. God sovereignly and freely chooses who will be the objects of His covenant love and promises, who will be the objects of His divine favor. And that choice is not based on any merit or worth or heritage or faith or faithfulness in us. It is sovereign and free. There are many in Christianity that find this view of God and the way he works out redemption unacceptable. They find it difficult. And they'd say, this, this doesn't seem fair. This doesn't seem just. This doesn't seem right. And that's exactly what Paul's going to go on to address in verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? This is exactly the objection he's going to uh, address. But I just want to stop this morning and acknowledge that sometimes texts like this are difficult to accept. I did not believe in Reformed doctrine when I became a Christian. And I had to wrestle with this doctrine. I had to struggle with what the scripture was saying and I found it difficult and I didn't know if I liked a God <laughs> that does this. And maybe you're there. And I want to say to you, it's okay. It's okay to wrestle. It's okay to struggle. It's okay to feel emotional. It's okay to, to wrestle and say, can this be? Look at Paul's emotion. But it's not okay to reject the word of God or to twist it or to squeeze it into our framework just because it makes us feel better. That's not okay. We have to wrestle. We have to struggle. We have to say, and it's, it's legitimate to say, is there any other way to understand this text? Is there any better way to understand this text? It's fine to wrestle with, is this the right understanding? But at the end of the day, the text has to be king. And we, we have to let God be who God is. We can't make him into the God of our own making. We can't force him into our own mold of who we would want him to be and how we would like him to work. And so I would just like you to ask this question if you're feeling emotional and struggling with this text this morning. Why? Why are you struggling with it? Is it possibly because of the frameworks you're bringing to this text? What are those frameworks? What are those preconceived ide ideas? What is that presupposition? What is your bias that you bring into this text? Because is the text difficult to understand? Isn't the, the logic and, what, and the statements that Paul is making here it's just so clear and unavoidable? It's easy to understand, but difficult to accept. And what I'd like to encourage you with is on the other side of the struggle is a different view of God, a glorious view of God, complete security in this God who plans and purposes and for some inexplicable reason has made me the object of his plans and his purposes and his grace. And because there's nothing outside of God that has determined that choice, nothing outside of God can change it. Nothing can separate me from that love. Nothing can change that love towards me. Nothing can thwart the plans and purposes of that love. That is why I love this doctrine now. I love it because it secures me in God's unconditional love. It tells me, God, I don't know why I should be the one. 
when you did your sovereign selecting, I have no idea. But I know what that means. It means you have drawn me sovereignly and freely into relationship with you, a relationship where you love me. Though others might rightfully face your wrath and your anger. And I deserve that as much as they do. I get love. That's what this text ultimately means. 